You know what videos I've noticed do really badly on YouTube? Videos that take a polarized topic and try to be nuanced about it. So let's do that. Happy Thursday, everybody. It's P. Tony, your friendly Catholic vlogger. The pink tax is a concept that at the store, women's products cost more than men's products. What do you think? Is that true? Does pink deodorant cost more than blue deodorant? Are corporations across America discriminating against women by charging them more for essentially the same products? Let's just count the number of trigger words in that question. We've got discriminating, we've got corporations, we've got women, we've got... <laughs> That's a trigger word. Uh, we've got charging, i.e. money talk, uh, and we've got, what was my last one? Uh, oh yeah, essentially the same, i.e. fairness. So if you hate me by the end of this video, I totally understand, God bless you. Now, of course, there are other people that have talked about the pink tax. So let me sum up for you the, the top five videos that come up from a YouTube search on the pink tax. Shoe on head has two videos that come up at the very top. <laughs> Do you know shoe on head? Uh, <laughs> She's, she's a, a person to watch, uh, I don't have more to say than that. She argues that the pink tax doesn't exist, especially developing the, the point that different products have different prices because they're different products. Yes, she says pink deodorant is more expensive, but that's because it has more ingredients in it. So of course it's gonna be more expensive. Video number three in my search was Gwen No Fear, who argues that yes, the pink tax is real, and yes, it's a big deal. She has a response video against Shoe on Head, and she argues that Yes, these products are different, but they are similar enough that we can compare them. And since they're similar enough that we can compare them and there's obvious price differences between them, there is gender discrimination going on. Both Shuan Head and Gwen No Fear uh, refer to an article um, that that seems to be important in this whole conversation. It's called uh, <clears throat> From Cradle to Cane, The Cost of Being a Female Consumer. Um, it's about 70 pages long. There's a link in the description down below. This article is a study where they compare a whole litany of pairs of similar products to see on average, you know, uh, does gender have an impact on prices? And it's 70 pages and that seems like a lot, but it's not too bad of a read, quite honestly. Um, and it's also referenced a lot in this topic. So I, it was good for me to read, right? The basic conclusions of this article is twofold. First half is, uh, yes, there is a difference, products are more expensive on the whole. Um, and second, the cost in production that, you know, the subtle differences between the blue version and the pink version uh, naturally incur does not justify the differences in these prices. So shoe on head, Gwen No Fear, this article from New York, they can all argue about are these products similar enough to compare or are they not? I want to move on. The next video on the list the uh, in the search was from BuzzFeed Blue. Oh, I don't want to BuzzFeed Blue is just a quick list video where they compare different pairs of products and show how one is more expensive than the other. Thanks BuzzFeed, can count on you to always be you. And the fifth video that came up when I searched for the pink tax was by this guy named Say Goodnight Kevin. Say Goodnight Kevin makes a lot of points and goes on a lot of tangents, that's kind of, kind of like what I do. Uh, but. In short, uh, he's arguing that the pink tax is not something that we need to be up in arms about. He gives three reasons. The first reason is, hey, these products are different enough that the differences can account for the differences in prices. This, this conversation just goes back and forth on that issue all over and over again. I mean, like, got tiresome, but whatever. But he adds two more reasons, right? The number two is that in his own sampling of comparing different products, he finds that, hey, sometimes the blue products are more expensive than the pink products. So <laughs> it can't just be gender, right? And his third reason, I think the most insightful reason that he offers is uh, prices are determined more than just by the cost of production. They're also determined by demand from the consumer. <sighs> Take a step back. Um, Cause honestly, this conversation felt like a mess to me. Is that dramatic? <laughs> I can be a dramatic a little bit, right? But let's reorient ourselves. Fundamentally, what is this debate about? This debate is asking why these prices are the way that they are. Where are these prices coming from? And phrasing it like that, I think is great. Why? Because we have a science that's really good at answering that question. It's kind of built to answer mostly that question. It's called economics. I mean, it does a little bit more than talk about prices, but Prices is a big deal in economics, and economics has a lot to say about prices. So if you'll allow me to be critical, a lot of these videos and even that 70-page study from New York City really did not look at this from the perspective of an economist, and I found that a little mm, disheartening, except for maybe Kevin. If you peruse through the videos, you can be a judge of that. Um, I think that there's a lot more that we can add to the conversation here today. You ready? So as for you and me, I think that this topic deserves to be treated from an economics perspective. 
And if you trust me, I think that I can bring in some economics concepts that'll make this pink tax a lot easier to, pu to, to puzzle through. So let's start by putting up a graph with a supply curve on it. Is this review? All right, so we've got an x-axis that is quantity, we've got a y-axis that is price, and we're gonna be talking about how much deodorant people sell and buy in this made up town called Balloon Town. All right, so we've got our supply curve here and it's sloped like this because the idea is that the higher the price is, the more people are willing to make deodorant. For example, if the companies know that if they make deodorant, they can sell it for $2 a stick, they're gonna make 50 sticks of deodorant every week. But if they know they can start selling it for $3 a stick, then they're gonna be willing to make 100 sticks of deodorant a week. The higher that price point, the more companies are gonna go out of their way to make deodorant. Why? Because they can make money on the deodorant. But now here's the question, how many people will buy the deodorant? So here's our demand curve in our simplistic graph of Balloon Town. And the way that I drew this up for this made up town, at $2 a stick, people are willing to buy 50 sticks of deodorant a week. And if the price of deodorant goes up to $3 a week, then people will be willing to buy about 25 sticks a week. That's, by the way, this is like all the consumers in, in Balloon Town. It's not like one person goes out and buys 50 sticks of deodorant every week. I hope that would be weird, weird person. I don't know what to make of that person. But this makes sense, right? Prices go up and people buy less of it, right? They start finding other ways. Like I, I might start using a, uh, a bar of soap for my deodorant instead of, you know, actual deodorant. <laughs> now this next step is fun. We can put these two curves together and we can predict not only what the price is gonna be of deodorant in Balloon Town, but also how many sticks of deodorant are gonna be sold every week. And we can predict that by looking at where the two lines meet. In this case, it looks like $2 per stick and 50 sticks a week. So what changes prices? Normally the way that prices change is if these lines shift, you know, like to the left or to the right. So for example, our demand curve, which is a straight line, don't worry about it. Our demand curve, let's pretend it's way further out to the right. What does this mean? This means, well, this is how we illustrate that people want deodorant more. Even when deodorant is $3 a stick, people are still willing to buy 100 sticks of it a week because they just want it that much more. I don't know, maybe the news got out that it cures cancer or something, I don't know. Now, if we put the supply and, and demand lines together, what do we have? We have a new intersection, suddenly it's $3 per stick and it's a hundred sticks per week. The demand curve moving to the right is just a sign that people want deodorant more. So what do the deodorant factories do? Well, they start making more deodorant. But as the deodorant factories make more deodorant, it gets to be more expensive to make deodorant. And that's because it gets harder for these factories to get what they need to make the deodorant. Maybe the ingredients they used to be able to buy in town, but now there's not enough in town because they need more than the town has. And so they have to go to the neighboring town and now they have to start paying for shipping. Or what about labor? Labor is a huge cost for any company. Before they had enough workers to get out 50 sticks of deodorant every week, but now they need to get out 100 sticks. So what do they do? Do they work overtime? Do they hire more people? Hiring more people in order to get more workers, sometimes you have to start raising your wages so that you can attract more people to your company. So yes, because people want more deodorant, the factories start making more deodorant so that they can meet that want. But also they have to start raising the prices because their own costs are rising. This is an important point because personally, as I read the 70 page article, um, I'm, I'm reasonably convinced that, you know, these products are similar enough that we can use them as comparisons and they should have similar uh, rates of production costs. That means they're on the same supply line. And for a given quantity, uh, the cost will be the same for pink versus blue. But here's a theory that I'm running with. If the demand for pink deodorant is higher than the demand for blue deodorant, what does that mean? That means that we're gonna have higher quantities of pink deodorant going out, being made. Um, and higher quantities means higher costs, and higher costs means higher price points. Even though the ingredients are perfectly comparable, perfectly similar for purposes of the study. It just gets harder and harder to get that lavender smell that girls like. Ooh, lavender, I hate lavender. I'm sorry. All right, so at this point, this is just a theory. This is the graph that I would put out as a theory of why pink products might be more expensive than blue products. Um, talked about it in terms of deodorant, but I think a similar logic could be applied to all sorts of different products. It's just because the demand is different. And we could theorize about why the demand is different, uh, but that's more of a, like a cultural question. Um, and for now, let's let's uh, let's look at this from the point of view of discrimination. What would our graphs look like if we uh, believed that? Well, if the more accurate theory is that uh, 
corporations are discriminating with their prices. So let's go back to our first graph with supply and demand in Blue Town. We've got $2 per stick, we've got 50 sticks per week. Now the question is why does the price and the quantity end up where the two lines intersect? And you know, it looks poetic and that's beautiful and uh, thank you, I am an artist. But also there's just some economic forces at work here, okay? Um, so for example, let's say that one company decides to raise their deodorant stick prices to $2.50 a stick. What's going to happen? Well, nobody will buy it because they know that they can get the same deodorant basically for $2. That's going to force the company to start to bring their price back down to $2 if they want to sell deodorant. But what if, what if there's only one company in Blue Town that makes deodorant? What then? If they raise their price to $3, there's nobody to stop them, right? I mean, the people of Balloon Town can't go buy other sticks of deodorant unless they have a car and dri can drive to the next town, but whatever, don't worry about that. If there's only one company that's that's supplying deodorant, uh, and if they raise the prices up to $3, the people buying deodorant really don't have anywhere else to go, right? So they'll continue to buy those $3 sticks of deodorant, but $3 is still expensive, and so they're gonna cut back on how much they're gonna buy, right? Um, and so suddenly, they're only buying 25 sticks of deodorant a week. So let's just compare the before and after here. Before the company was selling 50 sticks for $2 each, that's what, $100, right? Now they're selling 25 sticks for $3 each. That's $75 a week. So what would you pick? Would you pick $100? Would you pick $75? This company is probably not gonna raise their prices to $3 a stick. Why? Um, not because there's other companies that are competing with them, but simply because they'll lose too many customers. But is there a magic price in between where it might help them out? For example, what about at $2.10? What if, theoretically speaking, at $2.10 per stick of deodorant, people are willing to buy 49 sticks of deodorant a week? $2.10 times 49 is $102.90. If you don't believe me, please check me. That'd be great. Uh, peer review. And that might not be terribly much, but it is a little bit more than $100, right? Uh, so yes, it would be worth it to this company to raise their prices up to $2.10. Quick side note, yes, I'm calculating revenue here, um, not profit, which are not exactly the same thing. Technically, we should be talking about profit. I'm using revenue instead of profit because I'm trying to keep things simple, um, and I don't think that uh, it's going to actually affect any conclusions uh, that, that we draw out of our theorizing. Um, but let me know if you think that I've overlooked anything material by using revenue instead of profit. I appreciate that a lot. Okay, so this monopoly could happen in Balloon Town, but could it happen in all of America with all these different companies? In theory, yes. If all the companies cooperate with each other, it could definitely happen. It wouldn't be a monopoly per se, because there's more than one company. So instead we would call it an oligopoly. Monos is the Greek word for one. Oligos is the Greek word for a few. So we're just like swapping oligos in for monos. It would be a monstrous project to do this on purpose. Why? Because there's a lot of companies that make deodorant um, and, and they'd all have to coordinate. And also this is illegal. It's called price fixing. Um, so they'd have to hide it from everybody. So the whole coordination thing, you know, that sounds a little bit like a conspiracy that, I mean, I personally find hard to swallow, but you know, that that's fine. Uh, we, we could consider it. Or, so I can be on board with this theory. Um, we could talk about this in a, in a, cultural sense. There might just be a culture among deodorant corporations uh, where they know that they can charge more for pink deodorant than blue deodorant. It's just kind of the status quo. And that would effectively explain why pink deodorant costs more than blue deodorant. So where does that leave us? Let's sum up. First, I I believe that pink deodorants have higher prices than uh, blue deodorants. And that this, this is a pattern that extends beyond just deodorant and for many products. Second, we now have two different theories that could describe why prices are higher for pink than they are for blue. Um, they have graphs too. Uh, one we call uh, high demand theory and the other we call discrimination theory. So if both theories could describe the higher prices, how do we decide which theory is more likely? The answer is really simple. We just look for what other patterns do we expect based on these two theories that are mutually exclusive. Does that sound like gibberish? Maybe. Uh, but in other words, if discrimination theory is right, then we would expect there to be lower quantities of pink deodorant sold than blue deodorant sold, based on this graph. If higher demand theory is more accurate, then we would expect to see what? Exactly the opposite. We would expect to see 
more pink deodorant sold than blue deodorant. So how do we tell how many deodorants are being sold? I leave that up to you. <laughs> the next time that you're at the store shopping for deodorant, take a look, see around, and you don't have to be super precise, but just estimate, um, is there more pink deodorant on the shelves or is there more blue deodorant on the shelves? That'll be a rough estimator of what's being sold more because generally, um, this isn't entirely true always, I suppose, but generally stores put more of what they sell more of on their shelves. That was a confusing sentence. Will this be an ironclad proof that one theory is right and the other is wrong? No, <laughs> that's not how theories work. Um, but I think that we can consider this pretty good evidence uh, in favor of one theory and in disfavor of the other theory. And then based on that, we can decide which theory we, we trust more um, until we find another theory that we want to test. <laughs> this is how I live my life. I love theories so much. Let me know your thoughts down in the comment section. Um, what did I say that made sense? What did I say that didn't make a lick of sense? Uh, what did I overlook? I put a lot of thought and research into this, but also I recognize that I'm just an overage sophomore in college. Um, so I'm sure there's smarter people out there. Featured comment of the week, Mrs. Schnitt said in the last video, I like the blanket. Thank you, thank you, I like the blanket too. Um, I have so many plans for that, for that blanket. Doo -doo -doo. It's a magic blanket can do all sorts of magic things. And for everyone, do you appreciate my videos enough that you would buy me a cup of coffee once a month? Honestly, I think I earned at least a cup of coffee with this video, maybe even a beer. Oh, I could use a beer now. But that's up to you to decide. Uh, there's a Patreon link. You can find out what it looks like to patronize me. Um, I, I love my patrons, they're lovely. Or if you wanna do a one-time gift, there's my PayPal down in the description box. Many thanks to everyone who's already patronizing me, especially, do -do -do. I should not look in the bucket as I, <sighs> Michael, Michael P, thank you so much. I like Last week's video hit nine likes so far. Uh, let's see if we can get this video up to 20 likes. Boom, 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 baby steps. Y'all are the best. Thanks for watching. God bless and ciao.